Life's all about perspective, how you view life and how you view circumstances matters. And I believe that God wants to help us with our perspectives today. I'm going to preach a message called A Heavenly Perspective. And when it comes to life, life can feel like a battle at times, can't it? Uh, We can feel like we're battling against various forms of enemies. And, you know, when it comes to battle, uh, none of us have been in, in military combat. Uh, but perhaps we've played capture the flag at paintball. Any people played paintball before? You've done capture the flag. Uh, you know, that's that's the extent of military combat that some of us would have. Uh, for those uh, people who don't go outdoors, the extent of military combat you've had is um, with your thumbs as you played Call of Duty or something. Uh, and that's not, that's not real, okay? Uh, oh, it feels real with my VR thing and I've got my head... Pit. No, it's not real, all right? Uh, and so... The closest that some of us will ever get to real combat is paintball, which, which is pretty intense, I'll be honest. If you get hit on the skin in the neck from close range, friendly fire from one of your mates trying to be funny, it hurts. <laughs> Being hit on the knuckle, it hurts. And so when it comes to, to military combat, when it comes to even capture the flag in paintball, one of the tried and tested strategies is the need to fight for higher ground. If you can get a visual from above, many times it gives you a serious advantage over the opposition, over the enemy, and over who it is you're competing against. So similar to that dynamic and concept, it really does help in spirituality if we can gain the higher ground. If we can begin to have that vantage point, we can begin to see from above from God's perspective, from a heavenly perspective, what that does is it gives us an edge. It gives us an advantage in life. Rather than seeing the dynamics play out in front of us down here on earth, if we can get the higher ground and we can have that heavenly perspective, it can give us confidence to get through what it is we need to get through. So we're going to talk about a heavenly perspective today out of the book of Revelations chapter 4. And we're going to overlook some of the prophetic uh, oncoming dynamics that we see play out in the book of Revelation. And we're going to focus in on on a key thought and really believe that that God's going to speak. says these words, after these things, I looked. Perspective is all about what you're looking at. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come up here. In other words, there's higher ground. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now jump down to verse 8. It says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Very powerful passage of Scripture. We're going to consider some thoughts today, a heavenly perspective. I'm going to pray. Father, we need you to move supernaturally through your word. Let it come alive and let it help us to see that we can gain a perspective that will make the difference. Help us to see the power of our worship and speak to us about gaining this advantage over our enemies and circumstances. Bless your word and your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk firstly about heaven's perspective and to bring some context for what we're reading. And again, I'm I'm overlooking some of the prophetic dynamics of the book of Revelation. And I want us to just focus in. I'm I'm not neglecting it, but I'm focusing in on some principles to, to not just make a point, but they apply to us today and they will help us. The context of what's actually happening is 
here's John and he's actually been exiled. He's been banished to the island of Patmos. And, and during ancient times, people weren't always sent to prisons. They were. We know that Paul and Silas were locked up in, in a prison cell, uh, but sometimes they were banished. When we went to, the, to America, you know, however many years ago that was, probably 13 years ago-ish, no, what, 11, 12 years ago, around that, that time frame, we went to Alcatraz. So in San Francisco, we went over to the island of Alcatraz, and they actually have a prison on that island. And uh, we were able to have a tour, look around in Alcatraz, Um, But in ancient times, people were sent, and they didn't necessarily have a structure there. They were just dumped on an island. They were exiled on an island, and it would have been cold. There's no shelter. There's no food. They would have been isolated. And the reason that John was exiled to the island of Patmos is he was a pastor in the city of Ephesus. And in Ephesus, there was a temple that was dedicated to the emperor, and his name was Domitian. And this temple was, was in, the, in the center of Ephesus. They had statues of the emperor Domitian. And, and many times people were expected to go and worship at this temple and bow down to a statue of the emperor. And guess who didn't do that? John. He was preaching Christ and Christ crucified, risen from the dead. He, in fact, preached against Domitian and the idolatry found within the temple. And as a result, Emperor Domitian banished him to the island of Patmos. And so that's the, the, uh, the context of how he ended up on the island, if, if you're wondering. And some of you were, some of you were thinking about lunch. But either way, that is how he ended up on the island of Patmos. And how many know when, when you're doing God's will, you're pastor in a church, you're preaching truth, you're simply trying to live for God, you're trying to help other people know, know the things of God, and you are arrested and, and, and beaten up and taken across and abandoned on an island, it would be very easy to feel defeated. It would be very easy to feel absolutely worthless. And, and really, from an earthly perspective, it would, it would be very easy to start thinking, you know what, the devil's won. I've lost. Here I am trying to do a work for God. And now I'm banished to this island all on my own. The devil has beat me, man. The church is going to close down. Discipleship is going to stop. Our mission is going to be void. The devil has won. We're talking about heaven's perspective this morning. And we've got to understand the difference here because it's important to understand the earthly perspective is when we begin to see everything in the natural. The earthly perspective is when we see that we've been banished to the island of Patmos. The earthly perspective is when we see no hope for our circumstances. When we see that there is nothing worth doing because nothing will change. Whatever's going on in life, we become consumed with it. That's an earthly perspective. All we see is sickness and the kids constantly being sick. We, 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 we look at the church setting and we don't see what God is doing, we we just think about the backsliders and who's not here, right? Where we're consumed with with an earthly perspective. Rather than trusting God for open doors and new opportunities, we just look at the money issues. We see lack of fruitfulness. We see blockages and strains. It's an earthly perspective. Contrast that with a heavenly perspective This is the individual who says, God is in control despite my circumstance. Amen? God will make a way despite the fact I feel that there's a blockage. God can still get me out of this problem even though I feel like I'm sitting abandoned on an island. In our text, John's circumstances were not favorable, but he did not look at the circumstances. God, in fact, was inviting him to a place of spiritual advantage. God himself was telling John, hey, I have a perspective that I want you to have. And he says the words, come up here. Think about it. Verse 1, after these things, so after after him being thrown to the island of Patmos, After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet 
speaking to me, saying, come up here. There's a perspective available to you, John. Come up here. Come and see from this vantage point. Come and see from higher ground. Come and see from heaven's perspective. David did this in Psalms 121, verse 1 to 2. He said, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Kind of sounds like a rhetorical question, but there's actual legitimate meaning to that. In ancient times, many times the government officials, they resided on the mountains. In the hills is where their, their uh, offices per se or their, their houses and homes were. And so government officials would reside in the mountains. And so it's kind of like you and I saying, does my help come from the prime minister? Does it come from Canberra? Does it come from the lodge? Right? Does it come from the council or the governments? David's saying, does my help come from the mountains, the governments? It wasn't just rhetorical. It had legitimate meaning. He's saying, no, it actually comes from the Lord. But here it is. He's looking to the maker of heaven and earth. He's looking to God. He's contending in his circumstances to have a perspective from heaven. Doors may be closed on earth, but they can be opened in heaven right? That's what we're seeing here in our text in Revelations. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Well, on earth, pastoring the church in Ephesus, discipling men and women in Ephesus, helping people grow in their relationships with God and being filled with the Holy Spirit and making impact in Ephesus. Well, John, that door was closed, wasn't it? From an earthly perspective, it's all over. But from heaven's perspective, a door is open and God is saying to John, come up here. You see, God wants us to have heaven's perspective. Above our problems, above what the boss says, above what the economy looks like, above what interest rates are becoming above what family says, above the betrayals and the letdowns, doors may be closed on earth, but they can be open in heaven. We've got to see from heaven's perspective if we're going to experience that. So what do we see when we have heaven's perspective? If gaining heaven's perspective really matters, what do we see? What, what happens? What shifts? Verse 2 of our text, God had just said, come up here. Verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. You see, the reality is John was exiled by a demon-possessed ruler, Domitian, the emperor of Ephesus, but it didn't matter. Why didn't it matter? Because his God sits on the throne. That's why it didn't matter. And his God who sits on the throne was inviting him to see life and to see circumstances from heaven's perspective. It doesn't matter what the demon-possessed Domitian did. I'm on the throne. That's what God's trying to say. Listen, your boss is not on the throne. Amen? The government is not on the throne. The person who betrayed you is not on the throne. The devil is not on the throne. And so when we have heaven's perspective, what that does is it allows us to rest assured because we understand God is on the throne. That's heaven's perspective. Let's talk secondly about the dynamics of heaven. What we see in verse 8 really is pretty powerful. And... I feel the Holy Spirit often when I, when, I list, when I use this phrase and I even pray it in my prayer language. I don't say this part, but it says, The four living creatures, in verse 8, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day and night. And this is the power, and this is one of the dynamics of heaven. Capture this. This is what they're saying day and night, these angels. 
Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's supernatural. That's powerful right there. There's a dynamic going on there in heaven that is incredibly supernatural and worth understanding today. But if we boil it down to our context and the simplicity of our faith and our walk with God, what we're seeing is a dynamic that can be applied with you and I. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're flying around the throne of God, declaring that daily. What are they doing? They are worshiping. Worship is seeing God for who He is. It's seeing God in all of His splendor and all of His worth and value and giving Him all that He is worth with our value. Amen? The angels here, they're describing the characteristics, the attributes of God. They're worshipping a dynamic of who He is. We spoke about it this morning as we were breaking down the, the layers of the Lord's Prayer. Not a prayer that we say word for word and we recite, but there's seven principles in the Lord's Prayer that help us actually worship and understand our Father in heaven. The second layer after our Father in heaven is, hallowed be your name. We revere and we honor your name. We're seeing angels in heaven 24-7 doing that because of all of the multifaceted dynamics of God's name and nature. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're worshiping his name. Listen to those principles there. God is holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy means pure, different, separate, but it can also mean doing what is right. You know that you and I, even though circumstances may not look favorable, just like John on the island of Patmos, when we gain heaven's perspective, we tap into the dynamics of heaven, we understand God is holy, holy, holy. He is pure, different, separate. He does what is right. Oh, I don't know about you, but that gives me confidence. When all hell is breaking loose, when there are problems and there are circumstances beyond my control, I can rest assured because my God is on the throne and my God is holy and my God always does what is right. And if everything in my life feels wrong, I can rest assured because my God is going to turn it out to be right. The second dynamic we see, God is almighty. So God is holy, holy, holy. And then the second thing that we see the angels say, is Lord God Almighty. Almighty means he who holds sway over all things. It means ruler of all. That's our God. Even when a hell feels like it has the upper hand, God is almighty. He's in control of all things. Here's John on the island of Patmos on his own, taken from ministry and the church and people that he loved and that loved him in return. He's abandoned there. And he's having an encounter with God. And God is allowing him to see from heaven's perspective. My God is on the throne. My God is holy. He'll make all things right. My God is almighty. Hell may be coming against me, but my God still has the upper hand. This is the perspective that God is allowing John to begin to grasp and have. Thirdly, God is eternal. The angels say who was and is and is to come. You know, for you and I, we operate on a, uh, the system of time. And there are certain things in life that need to be done at certain times. And if we miss those certain times, those certain things won't get done. We are bound sometimes by our time. God is not. He is eternal. He is outside of the space of time. And there is no time and there is no circumstance that is beyond God's control. Some of the circumstances in our life, if we don't try to resolve it in the moment, we will miss that moment and time will, be, will slip away and we cannot resolve it. That does not happen with God. He is eternal. The last little principle that we see is toward the conclusive part of our text, that God has a creative ability. This should give us confidence. These are the dynamics that are going on in heaven that the angels are declaring that God is revealing to John that God's holy. 
He's almighty. He's eternal. And that he has a creative ability. The text says, for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. In other words, what God wants to happen, what God plans to happen, will happen. He has a creative ability. And that is very good news for you and I. Because Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who were called according to his purpose. And so, because God is creative, we can rest assured that his plans are good and what he wants to happen will happen. So, let's bring this to, a, to an understanding. If God is holy, if God is almighty, if God is eternal and God has this creative, powerful ability, what is the proper response to that God who's on the throne with all of these dynamics? We see our text. It says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. That is our proper response. He's worthy because of who he is to receive glory and honor and power. The word glory or glorify, we just sang it this morning. It means to shine light on. That's what it means to glorify something. It's, it's an opinion. When we glorify something or we glorify someone, what we're doing is we are shining light on someone or something. We're pointing something out. When we're giving glory to something, we are illuminating it as the standout amongst the rest, right? When you glorify a sporting team, you're elevating it to the top above the rest. Like just for example, we glorify the Maroons because they elevated to the top above the Blues. <laughs> we don't, okay? So if you didn't want to hear that, it's like we're spiritual today, Pastor. Don't talk about that. But, but, but you're giving glory to the team, right? Because you're illuminating, you're pointing it out. Sometimes there's a musical piece and someone's on an instrument or they're vocalizing and they're hitting these notes and you're like, whoa, that sounds incredible. You're glorifying it. You're illuminating it. You're, it's shining. You're pointing something out. When people graduate university, they've accomplished something. High school, they're coming to the conclusion of 12 years of schooling and again, university, another four or five years of education. They, they walk across a platform. They get a certificate. They are wearing a hat with tassels on it, a robe. They're getting acknowledged. There's an element of glory. There's a glorification process. There's a shining on an individual because of an accomplishment. God is worthy of the glory, of having all focus and attention and light shone upon him. Now, I'm saying that in principle, but I want to ask you, is that your reality? Does your worship match God's wonder? If these are the dynamics of heaven, that he is holy, he is almighty, he is eternal, he has this creative ability, and the only proper response to, to who he is as he sits on his throne is to glorify him, honor him, and give him power and worship. If that is the wonder of God, and you acknowledge that that is the wonder of God today, well, boil it down to you. Does your worship, not the church's worship, not other people's worship, does your worship match God's wonder? Because it matters. Some are in awe of the glory of God. Some are yawning in the presence of God. Which tells a lot about the person's heart. Don't think that your lack of worship is neutral, and let me be a little bit confronting now because I'm feeling a little bit more energized. Don't feel that it's actually acceptable either. 
I'm just taking my time. Well, it's actually an indicator of your heart. Someone not worshipping, you never look at them and go, they're close to God. Mm -mm. they got a really tight, intimate relationship with God. You never look at an individual who's yawning, drinking bottles of water, leaning on the chair in front of them, disengaged, late, as somebody who is engaging in worship. You don't look at them and go, yep, they're intimate with Jesus. They have a close connection, right? You don't. It's a heart indicator. When you are right with God, you will worship God. When you are right with God and you know who He is, that He is holy, He is almighty, He is eternal, that He has this creative ability, that He sits on the throne above all circumstances, that can make a way when there seems to be no way, He is sovereign and has a perspective far above our perspective. When you are right with that God, oh, you want to worship. So what would the contrast of that be? What would the opposite of that be? When you don't want to worship, well, what that would indicate is that either you are struggling and on the rocks with your faith or you're not right with God. Because if being right with God compels you to worship, not worshiping is an indication you're not right with God. Because worshiping is always an overflow of your heart. It's a heart indicator. But I'm a bit awkward. It's not about you. It's about God. Oh, but I don't want people to see me. No one's looking. No one cares about you. They're here to worship God. Get over yourself. That's pride. That's self-worship, right? Oh, it's a bit full on. No, it's the truth. When we know who he is, we want to worship. It's an indicator of heart. Pause for effect. The Holy Spirit, just deliver that in a little bit. A little bit deeper. These are the dynamics of heaven. How many people want the power of God displayed in their life? Oh, we all want that. That transpires when we realize this dynamic and we live from a place of worship. Worship isn't just what we do at the start of a church service. It is one of the times we worship, but we worship with our lives. We give Him the first of our time sacrificially, daily in prayer. We give Him the first portion of our income through tithes and offerings. That's a form of worship. And I just said a moment ago that when you know God, you worship God. When you're tight and connected and close and right with God, you worship God. And so when you're not giving Him your time in prayer or you're not honoring Him with your tithe, let this fall where it lands and you talk to God about this. Perhaps there's an area of your life you're not right with God. If you can't trust God in all areas, can you really claim you trust Him? I trust Him in this area, this area, this area, but I don't, I don't give to Him. Then you can't claim to trust God in every area of your life because you're not trusting Him with your finances. We need to honor and trust and revere and glorify and worship Him and give to Him because it's worship and it signifies that we're right. And what happens as we worship Him in all of these areas because of who He is and because he's worthy of it, there's a release from heaven to earth. We release heaven to earth. When we worship, things start to change. And again, it's not just worship with our song where we lift our hands and we sing, glorify, yeah, we worship. But we don't worship in any other area, right? Right? But when we begin to worship God with our lives, our devotion, remember what, remember what uh, Paul said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which means separate, holy and acceptable unto God, 
The New Living Translation says, for this is truly the way to worship. Our worship is not just in the lifting of hands and the declaration of song, but it's as our lives are laid down in sacrifice. And what happens as we do that, our worship is connected to heaven's involvement and participation in our lives and in our circumstances. Now, if we want to contextualize it with why we start our church services with praise and with worship, is because we want the presence of God and we want heaven to come to earth before we do anything else. Because if we just sing at the end three songs after we've got up and we've given taken the offering and we've given announcements and I preached, sometimes we we need to start worshiping with God because we bring heaven, we release heaven to earth. And you start forgiving people that you hold grudges against. You start going, you know what? I am going to stay married to you. Mm, I am. That happens through the song service. We haven't even got to the preaching yet, right? God moves upon you and go, yeah, I wasn't going to tithe, but I'm going to now. Mm, I was going to hold on because you know what? I love chicken and I want to get myself a family feast. But instead, I'm going to actually honor my tithe. How did that happen? Because heaven came down and you began to see things from a different perspective. You began to shift your defeated mindset to a victorious mindset. You began to believe in yourself and in God and believe that your circumstances could change. Why did all of those things transpire? Because heaven came down. That happens through worship. Do you want heaven to participate in your life? Do you want heaven's involvement in your circumstances? That comes through worship. Now, we we read verse 1 and 2 and then 8 to 11 of Revelations 4. The very next chapter, after this time of worship, heaven gets involved. And what we begin to see after this is while John is banished on the island of Patmos, think about this, his church is closed down. Perhaps he's, or he's away from it at least, it's probably continuing. But he's not there and no doubt there, are, there is an element of emotional strain on his life. And while he's there, he has this encounter with God and God's saying, listen, you know what? Doors may feel closed on earth, but they're open in heaven. Come up here and see from this vantage point. And then he begins to have this supernatural revelation, this encounter with God, and he sees these angels singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And he sees God on the throne, and he begins to devote and worship. Immediately after this, There is a supernatural dimension that begins to invade John's life. And what does he do? He has all of these prophetic, inspirational encounters with God. And what does he do? He pens the letter, which is the book of Revelation that you and I read. And there is prophetic truth, not just symbolic, but literal, that is manifesting and playing out in the earth today as a result of this encounter that John had on the island of Patmos. That's deep. That's deeper than some of us realize. Again, think about it. Banished on an island, feeling defeated, but having an encounter with God. Come up here. He gains heaven's perspective. He sees God for who he is. There's an element of worship that transpires in his heart, and God downloads the book of Revelation onto him. I don't know about you. Have you written any of the books of the Bible? No. So what looked like defeat ended up becoming an incredibly powerful moment, breakthrough in this man's life. He's sitting on an island in isolation, having the most intimate encounter with God any human has ever had. God is downloading the book of Revelation onto this man. And that came because of a book, because of a a posture of worship. Heaven was released on earth. And let me tell you, that's not an isolated event in Scripture. Think about Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas sitting in a prison cell. What did they do when they were there? Someone say the word. They praised and they worshipped. And what ended up happening? Heaven was released and came to earth. The chains were broken. The walls began to crumble. 
and they walked out of prison. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't a coincidence. That wasn't a mistake. That was the release of heaven to earth because people began to worship God for who he was. Joshua, marching around the walls of Jericho for seven days. And what caused the walls to fall flat at the end of that seven-day marching trip? Worship, acknowledgement, praise, shouting unto God. The release of heaven to earth caused those walls to fall and for the children of Israel led by Joshua to occupy Jericho. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the people again, they begin to worship and the enemy turn their swords on each other and they kill themselves and the children of Israel don't even need to pull out their weapons and go into battle because God got involved. There was a release from heaven to earth because of worship. Job, problem after problem, persecution and pain, circumstances that seemed incredibly unfavorable, but he responded in worship and in the conclusion of all of his turmoil, he received double in return what he actually lost. There was a release. Heaven came to earth. You see, if you want heaven to be manifested on earth, you need to be a person of worship. Amen? Gaining and maintaining victory in life, it is dependent on taking the higher ground. It is dependent on gaining the heavenly vantage point, on seeing all of life from a heaven's perspective. If you're caught up looking at your island of Patmos, looking at your prison cell, looking at the big walls, looking at all of your problems, you will never be victorious. But if you come up here, as God said to John, and you begin to see the open doors in heaven, which is opposite to the closed doors on earth, and you begin to see God who is holy, He is almighty, He is eternal, He has creative power, He sits on the throne, and you begin to worship Him for who He is, you begin to gain heaven's perspective, you begin to see life properly, the results of all of that worship is heaven will begin to participate in your circumstances. You'll begin to experience the breaking of chains, walls falling, enemies crumbling. There'll be a release of heaven onto earth and you'll experience blessing beyond all comprehension. That is our portion. If we would simply respond to the invitation to come up here and we would gain heaven's perspective. Let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes.